Okay. All right, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to HOMT 611 Events Management. Today is our ninth session and we will be covering risk management for events. As usual, by the end of the session, there are certain learning outcomes we hope to achieve. And today there's two of them. The first one is to be able to describe risk management as it applies to planning or hosting an event. And then the second one is to develop a risk plan that addresses mitigation measures, as well as contingency plans for identified and analyzed risks. So we will start um, during the course of, of, the, of the session. If there's anything that you need clarification on or anything you need explanations for or a question that you want to ask, please feel free to draw my attention so that we can help you resolve your issue before we go ahead. So on that note, let's begin. So why event risk management? We are considering event risk management because Events, by virtue of their nature, have the potential to be prone to certain kinds of risks and crises. And most of the time, as you will all bear with me, and for, based on practical experience, when you're organizing events, anything that can go wrong sometimes goes wrong. So in the event context, risk can be defined as the likelihood of an event not fulfilling its objectives because of uncertainty. And that is largely because events are generally laden with uncertainty, such that you can plan to the best of your abilities, but there's no way by which you can say for sure that everything that you have planned is foolproof, and there's no way that things will go wrong. Hence, the reference to events as being laden with uncertainty and risk being attached to them in the form of the likelihood of the event not being able to fulfill its objectives as a result of this uncertainty. So potential risks we are seeing vary to a great extent depending on the type of events that you are organizing. Because you will bear with me that there are different types of events that are organized on different scales. Some events are small with a few, a few number of people between five, 10, 15, 20 people. Some are medium sized a bit larger than the 20, perhaps up to upwards of 50, 60, 70 people. And then we have the large events and the mega events, which have hundreds and thousands of people that are accounted for. So in that instance, we can say that the larger the size of the event, the greater the extent of the potential risks that an event professional can encounter. And a number of these risks occur on a regular basis such that regardless of the events that you are talking about, these risks will always be prevalent. But ultimately, the event professional seeks to do one thing and one thing only, which is to make sure that their attendees have the best experience. Their attendees enjoy themselves as much as they can. And for the attendees to be able to have the best experience and enjoy themselves as much as they can, the event professional has to make sure that they do everything within their power to minimize the extent of risks and maximize the opportunities of creating value through the great experience that they're going to put out there for their attendees, such that the success of the particular events that they are organizing can be assured to a large extent, and which will, in the long run, influence the potential success of future events that will be organized by the event professional. So in that regard, what is risk management? Risk management is basically the practice of identifying, anticipating, assessing, and prioritizing risks, and appraising and controlling them. So what is this definition telling us? It is basically telling us that as an event professional, you, hope you have it as part of your duty, and it's essentially your responsibility to be able to make sure that you identify, anticipate, and assess all the possible risks that could be associated with your event. And once you have done that, you need to further go ahead and prioritize these risks. Because some risks are more of um, an emergency than others. So you need to be able to prioritize them in order of importance so that you can deal with them accordingly. And once you have been able to prioritize them, you now have to appraise each of them and try to control for them. 
because there are certain risks that are easily avoidable. And for those that are not avoidable, there are ways in which the event professional can plan to be able to mitigate the impact of such risks. So that is it for the definition of risk management. Now, as identified earlier, most definitions of risk will include uncertainty. And uncertainty here refers to the probability of occurrence of whatever event it is that is being classified as a risk. It also refers to the potential magnitude of damage. Because when you are talking about risk management, the whole essence of identifying, anticipating, assessing, prioritizing, and even appraising and controlling is to be able to mitigate or in some ways avoid the potential effects of these risks should they occur. Hence the need to identify the magnitude of damage that these risks can cause to your event should they take place. And this could include in extreme cases death because people have died at events for, for all sorts of reasons. We all remember the stadium disaster, a simple stamp feed that took place in a, at a friendly football match cost so many people their lives. Others have also died in isolated cases of food poisoning, allergic reactions, among others, right? So in extreme cases, we can talk of death. We can also talk about injuries. We can also talk about the cancellation of the event, which is something that is a risk that cuts across every single kind of event. And this kind of risk became prevalent during the COVID-19 era where almost every event that was being held, regardless of the size of the event or its importance, had to be canceled because of the emergency um, that we faced with the COVID-19 pandemic. So the cancellation of an event is something that is prevalent and event professionals can never avoid. Damage to property is another risk that we can talk about. And damage to property is also something that is not avoidable in any kind of event because property can range anywhere from damaging a simple piece of cutlery or damaging huge equipment like stage trusses or chairs or tables or speakers, among other things. We can also talk about costly lawsuits. In Ghana here, it's not very prevalent that event attendees sue event organizers, but in other parts of the world, it's very prevalent where event attendees and sometimes the clients who commission the events can go ahead and sue the event professional in the case that they deem that they have the event professional to not execute their duties in a, in a professional manner and therefore they seek redress in the courts of law and we can also talk about financial loss which is also very prevalent most of the time when you organize events there are certain losses that may occur some financial some non-financial but financial loss is definitely one that comes across um, for every event professional whenever they are executing their duties, regardless of the size and magnitude of the event. Among other things, these are some of the, of the risks that we can talk about and the kind of damage that they can cause as a result of the event professional not adequately planning and preparing for their occurrence. Now, to be an effective event professional, you need to be able to a large extent, like we said from the definition, identify, anticipate, assess, prioritize, appraise, and control for them. Now, based on the literature, this is specifically from Phoenix 2017, talking about how event professionals can go about classifying risks. Now, this is based on the Convention Industry Council uh, Accepted Practices Exchange for Risk Management. And this was developed in 2010, but it's still relevant to date. And they classified five different types of risk and their, how they can be defined and the potential effects that they can have on an event. So first of all, they talk about risk. And risk here, they, they, uh, they define as the possibility that a crisis, emergency, or disaster may occur. So when we talk about risk, like I said, depending on the magnitude of the event and the level of damage it can cause, you have to be able to think about it in terms of these five criteria. Because some events that take place while an event professional is executing their duties 
are less on the magnitude of damage, uh, are less on the, on the scale of the likelihood of, of damage that they can cause than others. Some events that take place while you're planning um, a particular event or occasion can cause a higher level of damage than others. And these events have been, these uh, classifications have been done taking what we just explained into account. So a risk is on the lower um, end of the spectrum where it does not cause as much damage as say an emergency would, which is on the more extreme part of the spectrum. So we start from the lower end of the spectrum and we work our way up. And on the lowest end, we have what we call risk, which is the possibility that a crisis, emergency or disaster may occur. So an example of this is where they are explaining that risk is not the crisis, emergency or disaster itself. It is only the possibility that it may occur. So that means that at the risk level, the thing hasn't happened yet, but there's a likelihood that it can happen. And if it happens, it could either re result in a crisis, an emergency, or disaster, and could probably affect business continuity. So risk is the lowest end of the spectrum that has the lowest likelihood to cause any damage because it has not occurred yet, and it, we are only considering the possibility of it occurring and what it could do should it occur. Now, a step above risk is business continuity. And this is the process whereby an entity keeps on delivering products and services for its clients and perpetuates its viability before, during, and after a disaster or crisis. Now, if you are not able to effectively manage risk and plan for them, depending on the scale of damage that whatever risk you were anticipating could cause, occurs, you will not be able to continue doing business because if it is a high magnitude level of damage like death or injury, it has a permanent effect on your reputation as an event professional, as well as all possible events that you are likely to plan in the future. So in that case, it could either halt for a period or completely stop your ability as an event professional to deliver products and services to your clients and stakeholders into the foreseeable future. So an example of this could be, for instance, if four people die in a freak tent collapse at your event, and several people file lawsuits of negligence and wrongful death, all implicating the event professional in what has happened. Perhaps if you have enough resources and event professional, you could fight it in the court of law and be exonerated and you will be found innocent. But the damage that the publicity from the various lawsuits and the word of mouth that has been exchanged has done to your reputation and your brand, in most instances, is irrevocable. So you will have to live with the consequences that this happened at your event for the rest of your life as an event professional. And it will have long-term implications on whether or not people even trust you in future to host events on their behalf. So that is it for business continuity. Now, when we move a step beyond business continuity, we come to what we call crisis. And crisis here, they define as an event characterized by having a small chance of care of occurring. But when it does, it carries significant risk that threatens the existence of an entity. And decisions regarding dealing with crisis must be made quickly. Now, crisis, as they have explained it, means that the event has occurred and it has gone from beyond the level of a risk, which only entails the likelihood or possibility of occurrence, to having actually happened. However, because of the nature and the magnitude of damage that it caused, it is not very high on the spectrum of events that could have lasting permanent damage to the reputation of the event professional. So the event professional has to act quickly to resolve such risks when they okay, so that they do not spiral out of control and have lasting effect on business continuity. Hence, the, the um, fact that decisions regarding crisis 
have to be made quickly. Because it is with these kinds of, of actions that the event professional takes, the speed and the efficiency with which they handle the situation, that determines their level of professionalism and how they will be able to move on subsequently to continue to host the event and perhaps recover and achieve the objectives of the event. A crisis, for example, could be a, a tornado striking the hotel where you are having a meeting or you are hosting an event. And perhaps there are several in serious injuries, the power is out and traditional communications are temporarily disabled. How would you act in such a crisis? This question goes to you. A tornado has struck. Say, perhaps it's not in Ghana here, we don't, we don't experience tornadoes. So let's say an earth tremor has struck the hotel where you're having your event. Several people are injured. The power is out. Your communication is out. You can't call anybody. People can't really see where they are going. What do you do as an event professional in such an instance to be able to wrestle this crisis? and to get it under control. Doc. Yes, Mercedes. I think first of all, you would have to tell the people to calm down. Awesome. Yes, I think when such things happen, the first thing is, I, I think we need to be told that everything will be okay. The Good. Then we'll be a bit, I mean, we'll be scared all right, but we know that at least there's some kind of hope. Good. <laughs> Oh, I think that's the first thing I would do anyway. So, Good. Yeah. Good. And it's the most excellent thing to do because technically when people are panicking, you can't get them to, to, do, um, to do anything because in the panic, they are being ruled by their fear. So the first thing to do would be to get them to calm down. So excellent point, Mercedes. So after they calm down, what next? You tell them to calm down, everything will be okay. What do you do next? Well, because of the traditional communication channels being temporarily disabled, if it's a hotel, I'm hoping that there may be some kind of, um, should I say, first aid, um, should I say, facility that um, we can, I can go to them so that at least they can come in to see those who are injured and then from there hopefully maybe if we are lucky we may be able to get maybe some access to the phone as in the phone may we may get some kind of connection and then we'd have to make a call to the nearest um uh, call the ambulance to to come in you you'll go to first aid first but you you have just told them to calm down how you even know those who are injured Does it make sense? Yes, yes, I, I, I get so it. Once you get so them, you would have to calm down. You would have to find out those who, I mean, what, what's, what happened to them? Good. Is everyone yeah, okay? Yeah. Is everyone okay. Mm -hmm. If you are injured, move towards perhaps a, a particular, so that you can be able to isolate those who are injured from those who are not. Sure. And then once you know those who are injured, then you can come in with your emergency service and give them the first aid. So good. In fact, it's an excellent way to handle the situation like, like, like you have just said. So well done, Mercedes. So in that case, Thank the crisis you. will be averted because you have been able to get the people to calm down. You have been able to isolate those who are injured. So once those who are injured are taken care of, those who are not injured, you can be able to help them find a safe place to perhaps hang out until they can all leave the place to their various um, places of origin or destinations, or they can just um, calm down until they are all okay. And then you can perhaps be able to, to salvage what is left of the event with those who are not injured. But very well said, Mercedes. So that is it for crisis. Now, a step above crisis, we have disaster. And disaster is where the event has a high impact in terms of the magnitude of damage and it occurs abruptly in an unforeseen and manner and usually results in significant loss of damage. Like I just said, it's higher up on the damage and magnitude scale. 
So, for instance, the roof of a convention center in which an exhibition is being held collapses, killing about 100 people attending and participating in the event. This is a huge disaster. And in the occurrence of such an event, there is not much that you can do as an event professional, but apply the same protocols that Mercedes just helped us to, to go through. You need to be able to get people to calm down, get as many people as you can to safety, and then try as much as possible to get in contact with emergency services to do as much as they can. Remember yesterday we talked about how important it is when you're organizing events to at least have one or two medical personnel around and at least an ambulance, just in case something happens. So if you have these people on, on, on ground, in the occurrence of such a disaster, they can quickly step in and start doing some first aid while you try to get in touch with more medical personnel to come and support. But imagine such a disaster happens and there's nobody on site. Perhaps it may even increase the number of casualties because the number of people who could have received um, some first aid treatment and at least survived may have to wait until you try and get in contact with medical services to come all the way from wherever they are coming from. And it could have been valuable time lost. So it is very important, again, for the event professional to, to be up and doing when it comes to disasters. And then highest on the magnitude of damage are emergencies. And again, emergencies like disasters are unforeseen events have a very significant impact in terms of damage, very high on the magnitude of damage scale. And they often result in mortal injury, life-threatening injuries for that matter, property damage, right? And with, this, with emergencies similar to disasters, there's no way you can continue the event or salvage it from then on. It becomes more of a suspension or complete cancellation from then on because there's nothing left for you to be able to carry on with the event to even attempt a successful completion. An example of this, for instance, is the case of food poisoning, which strikes a corporate group following a dinner for, say, 300 people, right? In this case, the food that was served to everyone at the entire event is likely poisoned or unwholesome, right? And in many cases, such uh, emergencies require significant numbers of people being hospitalized. So that is it for emergencies. So as an event professional, you need to be able to rank the likelihood of setting uh, events or situations taking place at the events that you are organizing along this scale to be able to determine how serious they are in terms of the, the risk of, of, of them occurring and the impact that they might likely have on your business continuity. And once you're able to determine this, you can be able to rank them as either just a risk that is likely to occur, a crisis, a disaster, or an emergency, each of which comes with several consequences that the event professional will have to deal with. So in knowing what we know now about the likelihood of certain situations occurring and the effect that it can have on Yes, Mercedes, please come in. Yes, and um, before we uh, start this one, the emergency, the example there. Yeah. I'm just um, wondering, you know, sometimes, uh, depending on the type of food poisoning in quotes, yes. it's, it may not happen there and then. Exactly. Yes, so with that, um, let's say, so with that, I mean, the, the program can continue, but then should I say you would, see the effect after yeah. the, 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 the event. Yeah. So it's, it's likely that you can have it occurring there, depending on how the, for example, maybe if yeah. you take an example like, let's say, salad. Yeah. Salad is a typical example. And let's say yeah. it was prepared very early in the morning. Yeah. And I always say everybody is different. Everybody's stomach is different. So yeah. it's possible somebody can eat there and then, and then the person can start having um, a reaction. Yeah. It's possible to that some may eat and their reaction would come, um, should I say, after the event. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, is it possible that you can have cases like that? Yes. So that's it's why an emergency, all right, but it, it will not. Mm -hmm. That's how we said in the beginning. You see the part about business continuity. Yes. That's how yes. we said in the beginning that mm -hmm. the risk could affect the continuity of your business either before, later, during, or mm -hmm. after. 
So what uh-huh. you're explaining now yeah. is the yeah. after sex yeah. scenario. Uh-huh. So I'm just thinking that is it possible we could have some some kind of examples that could fit um let's say an emergency and let's say the example i'm talking about let me even use my example of um, the ghana to the world let's say some people come for the function yeah they come and buy some of the food stuffs from the vendors yeah and then later on they, they realize that i'm just looking at that as an example is it possible so for me i, I may not put it under emergency maybe yeah. i may put it under business continuity is it possible okay. yes it is okay. It is because in this case, if the people are able to trace it back to your business, some people back have to, a loss. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So you can place okay. it under so business. It's possible we can place it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and, and doctor. Yes, Joan. Doctor, and to add to that, yeah. what can happen is that um, if you have, let's say, more than five or three people who have been to the event complaining about the same thing, yeah. then maybe you can say that it is from your end or maybe 10 people. But yeah. if you have a group of 300 and only two people are complaining, yeah. it's likely oh, that, that one maybe they, is, mm-hmm. yeah, they took something yeah. before coming. Something else, or, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So, uh, what I wanted to yeah. add was that sometimes the event may be the, the, the issue may be a minor thing. Like for instance, it may be crisis level. But depending on how you handle it, it can turn into a full-blown emergency. No, no. Exactly. Yeah. Like, for instance, during the event, one person came to complain. Two people came to complain. Three people, you just ignored them. Then you don't hear anything again. Then after the event, you get larger numbers coming in. That in itself can cause a whole problem. Because assuming during the event, you listen to those two, three people, and you actually did a bit of investigation to see if there was some substance to the allegation, you may have been able to avert those other people who later on came after to complain when everything had ended. Please, does it make sense? Yes, please. Definitely. Mm. So you have to be very sensitive to some of these things. So, which means, Doc, from what you've just explained, yeah. if it all depends on how best we are able to manage the, the, the let me use risk exactly. in, um, in the event. Because if you're able to manage it well, something that is, um, let's say, a crisis can yeah. maintain, like be maintained as a crisis. If you don't manage it well, it can turn into like disaster or emergency. Exactly. Okay. okay. Exactly. All right. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so knowing what we know now, what are some of the benefits of risk management? We can talk about two main ones when it comes to the event professionals and the execution of their duties. The first one being that it assists you as the event professional to try to prevent and minimize costs and losses, as well as problems that could occur during your event that perhaps may have lasting consequences on your reputation and your business moving forward. And it also helps you to protect your assets because in the event that there's a risk of property damage and you are able to put in place measures to mitigate or store that risk from actually occurring, you would have been able to protect your valuable assets and not have to spend money to replace those assets. Also, risk management assists event organizations as well as event professionals to plan and conduct events in the safest possible manner because you are bringing numbers of people together. These are human beings. And the moment you bring them together in that manner, you are responsible for them and whatever they do and whatever happens at that point in time during the time that the event is taking place. So once you you put in place risk management measures, you have been able to guarantee the safety of all these people who have been put under your care for that period of time. And ultimately, you enjoy the long-term benefits of a good reputation as a result of having put in place all these safety measures to ensure that the event comes off without any hitch. So those are the benefits of risk management. 
Now, how do we identify and characterize hazards and risks, which is one of the key parts of, of, of risk management as we saw from the definition. Now, a hazard is something with the potential of, of causing harm, which we have, we have determined is, is the key element of risk. Now, all hazards should be identified by understanding the environment or the context in which the event takes place. For instance, you are having an event for children. There are two main places you can have the event at. One, you can do it at the poolside in a hotel. And the other one, you can do it in a, on a plain field with green grass, say the Ifwa Sutherland Children's Park. Which venue will have more hazards? Ifwa Sutherland Children's Park, plain field, green grass, or say Kempinski Hotel, poolside? These two, which one has more hazards? Uh, Kimpiski Hotel, two side. Why? Yeah, because of the swimming pool, some of the children will be tempted to go and swim. Mm -hmm. And those who even don't know how to swim will even try to jump inside, which can lead to a lot of problems. Good. So the Kimpiski Hotel pool side is, is definitely more hazardous. If not just the pool alone, there's water um, on, on the tiles surrounding the pool. The likelihood of someone slipping and falling and hurting themselves is very high because no children play very rough, right? So yes, the Kempinski Hotel poolside is more hazardous than the children's park. So this is a typical example of what we mean when we say understanding the environment or the context in which the event takes place. By virtue of the context in which you are having the event, you can be able to adequately assess which hazards will probably be present and be able to plan adequately for them, right? So as an event professional, it's not just about choosing the cheapest venue or the venue that offers you the most fun or the most activities or the best experience. To a large extent, it boils down to the number of hazards that the venue presents to your potential attendees, depending on who they are, their lifestyle, their demographic, among others. So this is the key way by which we identify and characterize hazards. So looking at that, let's look at some categories of risk or hazards that we can identify. Based on the NFPA 2007, we can identify three main categories of hazards. The first one being natural hazards. And the natural hazards are the ones that we have no control over. They just occur naturally. However, because of certain sources of information that we have, like say the Ghana Meteorological Agency, or the weather apps on our phones and tablets, and the weather websites that we can consult, to a large extent, some of these natural disasters and somehow predict whether or not they are going to okay. So for instance, the Ghana Meteorological Agency provides regular data to the television stations and radio stations. And then the weather apps we have on our phone sometimes give us the weather forecast ahead up to about a week or two to tell us whether there's the likelihood of a thunderstorm, the likelihood of rain, right? The likelihood of, of um, before the Ghana Seismological Agency used to tell us um, about the possibility of earthquake and earth tremors, but these days we don't hear anything from them. And recently there was an earth tremor which people were, were very uh, concerned about because there was no prior warning, right? However, with natural disasters, like I'm saying, there's no way we can control them. But we have ways of learning about them beforehand. So as event professional, you need to, as an event professional, you need to use the resources you have at your disposal to be able to see if you can determine the likelihood of any of these um, natural disasters occurring during the time you're organizing your event, prior to it or after, to be able to see if there's any potential risk you have to um, prepare for. And examples of these natural disasters include hurricanes, tornadoes, which we do not have in our part of the world, earthquakes we rarely experience in Ghana, apart from the few tremors here and there from time to time. Brush fires, we rarely experience them in Ghana. Mudslides, snow, we don't experience them in Ghana. Rainfall, we do experience, and we know about Ghana's perennial floods. Right now, they become annual floods because every year the floods occur around the same time May, June, July. And there's always loss of life and loss of property. 
So these are disasters that occur on natural level that we know will happen in our parts of the world, namely rain, perhaps occasional earth tremor. We have rarely had heat waves in our part of the world. I think we are, we are used to hot weather. Occasionally the weather gets too hot, but we are used to it. So the main ones we can say we experience here is the rain, the thunderstorms, and then the occasional earth tremors. So these are examples of natural disasters as, as an event professional. You can try to put in place certain measures to mitigate should they occur because you can't stop them from occurring or you can be able to mitigate their effects should they occur then we have the human caused risks which are prevalent in almost every event for example we can talk about assault you can never tell where a fight will break out because you are dealing with humans and humans are very complex individuals you can't fully understand them so you never know what could be a source of discord or disagreement between two people that could erupt in a fight at your event. And I've seen people fight at some of the most classy places. So assault is something that as an event professional, you always have to prepare for, regardless of the kind of events that you are planning. Another human cause um, risk that could occur is a presenter no show. I've also been to events where the MC that was booked in advance somehow did not show up, or one of the speakers could not show up for whatever reason. So as an event professional, you always need to have contingency plans to make sure that such um, human errors relating to no shows you can be able to recover from. Then other errors may, other risks may include slander, libel and defamation, right? In the events that you have, you have certain attendees that are speaking ill of your events that you organize as an event professional. Perhaps if they came to your event and two or three people had food poisoning. Perhaps it wasn't your fault or the fault of the food that you served at the event or the caterer that, that catered for your event. It's something totally isolated and unrelated. But people at the event who know these individuals will start going around speaking negatively about your event planning business and your, and your event planning skills just because three people attending your event in an isolated case got food poisoning. So that's an example of slander, libel, and defamation. And Again, as an event professional, there are ways by which you can protect yourself from this. Some event professional will often issue a press release, distancing themselves from whatever is going on and reassuring people that they had nothing to do with it, among other things. There are so many ways by which you can handle um, this sort of human caused risk. We can also talk about copyright infringement. This um, sometimes is, is rare when it comes to event um, organizing. Copyright infringement often comes in when you are dealing with issues of the creative arts. So perhaps as an event professional, you organize a music concert or you organize um, a, an art exhibition or a convention. And then maybe you were playing some music that um, you were not allowed to play. Or perhaps people were performing at your event and using music of people and not clearly acknowledging them. These are all forms of copyright infringement that perhaps may affect the, the activities of, of an event professional in executing their duties. Another serious risk that occurs at events, and it occurs at every single event that I know of, is theft. Regardless of the size of the event, some kind of thievery usually occurs, be it a birthday party, um, a wedding, a funeral, um, an engagement, a concert, a meeting, a conference, regardless of the scale of event thievery is always um, a potential threat or risk. So security is very important when it comes to event organizing. Another final one we can talk about is entertainer cancellation. You can have entertainers that you have lined up for events canceled. And there are so many reasons why this occurs. So like I said, with regards to the no-show, you have to be able to have a contingency plan. What is your backup? in case your entertainer does not show up, or in case your MC does not show up, or in case one of your speakers does not show up, you need to have a contingency plan to be able to deal with it. And then next, we can talk about technological risks. And these days, because of the nature of events and organizing and planning, there's a lot of technological innovations that have been introduced into the era. So you have to be able to have a fair idea of the level of risk that you as an event professional stand to, to um, encounter 
when it comes to applying all these technological innovations in organizing your events. For instance, there's a conference app that you are using to keep track of your attendees, to do their registration and everything. And on the morning of, of, of the event, the app crashes. What is your backup? You should be able to have backup measures put in place to perhaps do a manual registration because the application that will help you do the manual, the, 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 the electronic registration is down. There's nothing you can do about it. So you need to put in place contingency measures. Assuming you have an event and there's a power outage. One of, we saw in one of our, our classmates templates um, in our last session that they made provision for a standby generator, which is very important because power outage is something that in recent times is not very common, but previously was very common in our, in our country where you, the lights could just out of the blue go off for no reason. So to be able to, to um, mitigate the effect of a power outage and its influence on the success of your event, you have to be able to have an alternate power source. And the standby generator is a good one to ensure that once the power goes out, you quickly switch to that and the, and the show goes off. In the event that you're also using a computer, like I just mentioned with regard to the registration app and all that, it could crash. And when it crashes, you have to make sure that you have manual means on standby that you can use to quickly continue the process so that there are no breaks in the service delivery as regards the event execution process. You could also lose data or misuse your data, right? When you are gathering the, the information of events attendees, especially at meetings and conferences, there's a likelihood that the data that you are gathering could be stored on, say, an external hard drive, on a laptop, or whichever technological device you are storing it on. There's a likelihood that you may lose the data. So these days, technologically, we have a fail-safe measure that we use by storing a lot of the information in the cloud. So that in the event that whatever device you are using to store the data crashes, the moment you get to another device and you are able to connect it to the internet, you can just download all the data back from the cloud. The very popular one that we all use these days is Dropbox. How many of you have heard of Dropbox? How many of you have heard of Dropbox? No, I've heard of it. Do you use it? Not really. You don't use it. Mercedes, do you use it? Um, we use a similar thing in the office, but not the name is not Dropbox, but it's similar to Dropbox. Okay, okay, mm. all right. So mm. I use Dropbox mm. and I store all my information on it because you, you move across multiple devices at a time. And you want to make sure that all your information is available to you regardless of where you are. And it's the same with your job as an event professional. You can have hundreds and thousands of clients who perhaps have commissioned you to organize events. And looking at the kind of information that we keep, you have your Gantt charts, you have your um, stakeholder maps, you have your budgets, you have so many uh, uh, the work uh, structures that we develop to be able to see the various activities and progress with regard to achieving those activities. You have all this information together. Assuming you're storing it on one laptop and that laptop crashes, what happens? You lose all the data. Will you go back to each and every client to say, okay, my laptop crashed. I need you to tell me all the information we, we agreed on all over again. Perhaps you have even started a planning process. Perhaps the names and, and contacts of all your vendors are on the same laptop. What happens when something like that <laughs> goes wrong? It's disaster for you as the event professional, true or false? Very true. Good. So as an event professional, you need to have a good backup. And the best backup you can have is to keep it in the cloud. Once it is in the cloud, you know you can access it at any time and at any place, regardless of what happens. So even if your laptop crashes, your phone crashes, whatever, you can quickly download all the data back again. And what we just explained is directly linked to communication loss as well. Because once you lose the contact details of all your clients and your vendors, how do you get it back to be able to find and communicate with them? Right? So you have to be able to put in place measures to mitigate the effects of technological risks. And then finally, audiovisual problems. I know for a fact that there are 
for every five events I have been to, two out of three have audiovisual problems. I spend like five or six percent of the time at the event listening to hello, testing mic one, two, one, two. Hello, can you hear me? The speaker where came. This was experienced that thing before. No, I have. Every single event, almost every yeah. single event, you, you will see that thing happen. And I asked myself that when the people were not here, when the attendees had not started coming, didn't you test these things? Hey, madam, some of these things you can finish testing and just before the program starts, because they are electronics, they can go down again. So <laughs> you have to continue until the program is finished. Exactly. But still, <laughs> it's very irritating when guests are sitting there and you are not trying to solve audiovisual problems. But Hey, you're right. It's another risk that can occur, and it can occur before, during, uh, before or during the event, right? So that's another um, item on the list of technological issues that may come up that the event professional has to has to prepare for. So that is it for the risk categories. Now, in terms of the different categories, we can put them into specific areas to consider. Given that we have natural, human cause, and technological risk categories, these uh, categories have different areas under them, right? So for instance, when we talk about environmental risk or act of God, what category would they fall under? Environmental risk or act of God, what category will we place them under? Under natural. Good. So here we need to analyze the physical location and the site where we are having the event. What are the conditions there in terms of nature, especially when you are having an outdoor event? In Ghana here, what are the two main natural disasters that I mentioned we could we could we could expect? I mentioned another, the rain and the heat. No, so there's another one. The rain, yes. The heat rarely, because like I mentioned, we, we someone somehow become accustomed to the heat. But there was another one, which we experienced recently in some parts of Accra. Yeah, death tremor. Death tremor. Death tremor. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So you need to consider all these things as they relate to the environments that you're organizing your event in. So everything from bad weather to earthquakes or tremors, floods lightning, storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, and avalanches, which we don't experience much in our part of the world, as well as other natural disasters. And chief above all, pollution. Remember I kept insisting that our floor plan must always have a means of disposing of refuse or trash. Because when we don't dispose properly of our refuse and trash, it leads to pollution. Right. So that is another important thing that we need to, to consider. Okay. So, second area we can consider is fire. What category will we place fire under? What categories can we place fire under? Madam, it can be under natural and also the human cause. Good, that's true. So, fire safety is a major task to be considered because fire can just erupt naturally out of nowhere or someone can, can out of human error start a fire or someone may intentionally come and set fire at your event right so apart from obvious threats and general fire precautions you need to also think about electrically induced fires which are not sometimes may not be as a result of human error they may also not be natural or perhaps the technology itself is old or perhaps the technology is faulty and it can just out of nowhere spark spark fires so that is it for the second area we, we can consider which is fire now the third area is health and safety risks as well as the risk of alcohol and drugs where will we place this one health and safety risk of alcohol and drugs what category will that one fall under madam it will be under the human the human cause exactly Right, so for bigger events especially, we need to make sure that emergency medical services are available on site. Like I emphasized in our last session, emergency medical services have to 
always be present at every single event that you are organizing, right? Because you are thinking about the wellness and safety of your attendees. And in considering that still under health and safety risks, we need to think about things like food safety, the quality and safety of the water that you're offering people to drink. Are people safe from injuries? Because some, some venues by virtue of the, their, their setup and the context are hazardous. Like we talked about the Kempinski poolside party for children, for instance, right? It is highly prone to cause certain levels of injury to children, right? If it's an evening event, you also need to think about good lighting. Because if the venue is well lit, but the, the roads and the paths leading to the event are not well lit, it is, it is recipe for disaster. Because it will not be safe for people to, to be coming to and from the venue. Right? We also need to think about the safety of the setup within the room, the stage setup. Some stage trusses, if not fixed very well, can collapse in the middle of your event. And these days, they've been using a lot of pyrotechnics at, at events. Please, do you know what pyrotechnics are? Yes. Good. The one they do at the wedding reception that um, sprays like fire and all of those oh. are pyrotechnics. And they all present safety hazards because in the event that, God forbid, one of those sparks catches a fabric and it turns and it, it erupts into, into a fire, it could be a serious problem for, for you as as an event professional. And then we can talk about communicable diseases like COVID-19, among other diseases that are airborne and human spread. So right now, as an event professional, when you are organizing an event, you need to think about social distance and COVID-19 protocols, such that we saw one of our, our, our colleagues introduced hand washing and hand sanitizing stations at the, at the venue of the events, just to make sure that they keep in, in line with the, the protocols for for ensuring safety in this era of COVID-19. As an event professional too, certain events are prone to um, alcohol and drug abuse. For instance, you find um, not popular in countries like Ghana, but in other parts of the world at concerts and, and at, at huge events, certain drug peddlers see it as an opportunity to come and sell different kinds of drugs to different attendees. Right, and then there's also the likelihood that people will consume alcohol sometimes to dangerous levels at such events. So you need to make sure as an event professional, you put in place measures to pre prevent the consumption of these drugs that may be sold illicitly at this event, and also be able to help people control their alcohol consumption so that it does not end up causing problems and disaster for your event in the long run. So that is it for health and safety risks, alcohol and drugs. Now we can talk about human error and crowd management. And this one clearly falls into which category? Which category do we place this one under? Human cost. Yes. We can also place it under another one. We can also place it under another category. We had three categories. I think not. Now, what of Natural. Natural. Apart from human, what other categories? Are you sure? Technological. 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 So. Yeah, technological. Because the data loss could be as a result of they have yeah. um, uh, your assistant not properly shutting down the phone. Mm. Or your assistant innocently misplacing the hard drive that was paid for the Right? So human error proves to be a frequent person. We are talking about the types of risk to, to be invested. Right? We can also talk about the fact that crimes do happen. Like I said, thievery is very popular at events. And sometimes you can experience vandalism, especially when fights break out. And people may get assaulted. Some people too may just be mischievous and just cause all kinds of problems at your event. We can also rule out acts of terrorism, which some time back became a huge threat in Ghana here because they received a lot of intelligence of probable terrorist acts that were being planned. Right? So you need to think about, about, about these things when you're an event professional. 
and put in place additional security as well as cleanup costs and noise control because in the event that vandalism takes place or a fight breaks out and tables are thrown all over the place chairs are thrown and things are spilled on the floor you need to make sure that to ensure the safety of people these things are cleaned up and cleared out of the way as quickly as possible and in the event that this um, assault or rockers or fight that takes place leads to high noise levels, perhaps at an event that is not meant to be noisy. You put in place measures to control for the noise, perhaps have security escort these people who are causing all this noise and rockers out of the venue as soon as possible to restore normalcy and order, right? You also need to think about crowd control when you're organizing events with large numbers. You should have measures in place to ensure that in case something happens, you'll be able to keep them calm and be able to help them orderly exit the venue should it become necessary. That is why you can't design a site plan without having clearly marked exits and entrances. Because that is the only way that you'll be able to get people safely in and out of the venue, especially when it is in a closed environment. And you experience a natural disaster, for instance, like an earthquake, or you experience a disaster like the, the roof caving in. People should be able to easily get in and out of the place safely so that no one gets trapped there. So that is it for human error and crowd management. Next, we can talk about electrical power. This one will fall under the category of, what category will this one fall under? Technological. Technological, right? Small indoor venues and, and they have some outdoor events have power requirements, like you said. In case the sound systems and the lighting that you are using require large amounts of power, and maybe the wiring of the place may not be able to support that power. You may need to, to make a provision for additional sources of power to ensure that you can power all the sound systems and the gadgets and the pyrotechnics and all the different technologies that you are bringing there, right? And the backup power plan is always necessary. Even if the power within the venue is enough to support all the equipments that you are using. You need a, a, a backup power plant, perhaps a generator with fuel on standby, just in case by some, by some act of, of government, ECG decides to, to turn the power off at that particular point in time. You can be able to fall on the generator to continue your event. However, having alternative sources of power do not come cheap, because especially depending on how many equipment you are powering and the size of the venue, you may need a generator with a higher capacity, which will be more expensive and will require more fuel for you to be able to operate. So that is it for electrical power. Then we can talk about financial risk. And here, when it comes to financial risk, we can talk about things like default risk, market risk, currency exchange rate changes, decreasing cash flow, the unsatisfactory financial state of your sponsors, to name but a few. When we talk about default risk, an event professional always runs the risk of people not paying them. We learned from Bless last time, sadly, that people are still owing her. People she actually trusted and did things for, they are still owing her. And she knew it was a risk in the beginning, but she ignored it because she thought these were people she could trust. So that's a typical example of how default risk is alive. And therefore, as an event professional, you can't afford to ignore it. There's also the, the, the issue of market risk. Generally, you are operating in a marketplace. And there's a number of things that rule the marketplace. So in organizing your events, there are so many aspects of the market that could change and alter your event planning and organizing process. For instance, you have planned a certain budget. Perhaps if you were the caterer, as well as the, the, the one providing beverages, as well as the one who is doing decoration. You have provided budgets for how much it's going to cost you to get table linens, centerpieces, food ingredients, among others. But perhaps market conditions change, and all of a sudden the prices of food items on all these table linens and items double. It will affect the prices that you charge in the beginning in the budget that you created, because all of a sudden the budget will, will be half of what you actually need to be able to execute the event. And that is a typical example of market risk that we look at. So as an event professional, to a large extent, you need to be able to have a good knowledge of the marketplace. 
and anticipates that perhaps this event is going to be held in three months' time? Is there a possibility that prices will go up, things will change? If so, then you have to put in place a contingency plan to add some extra into the budget just in case the prices of things change and you need some extra money somewhere to buffer what you do to successfully execute the event. Currency exchange range changes too can affect your, your activities as an event professional, especially where perhaps you are dealing with clients who are paying you in foreign currencies or you are dealing with clients who have requested certain items that you as the event professional perhaps have to import using foreign exchange rates. All these things could be influenced by currency exchange rates that may ultimately affect your executing your duties as an event professional. You can also talk about decreasing cash flow. Sometimes as an event professional, based on the contract that you signed, you are expected to pre-finance certain things. And perhaps while you were pre-financing, you realize that you do not have enough money to be able to finance everything that you have undertaken to pre-finance. And that could be a direct effect of, of decreased cash flow. So you need to be able to, as an event professional, plan so that at any point in time, you have enough cash flow to pre-finance everything that you're supposed to pre-finance or pay for everything that you're supposed to pay for so that your events can come up without a hitch. And most importantly, especially when you're dealing with events that have sponsors, we have to discuss the unsatisfactory financial state of sponsors. Like I said, some sponsors find it very easy to commit to give you sponsorship, especially when it's financial. But once it comes to actually parting with the money, it becomes a problem. To the point where I know event professionals who have actually received their sponsorship checks after the event has taken place. Has anyone experienced something like that before? Yes, my dear. Has anyone experienced something like that before? Okay, perhaps not. But in several instances, sponsors can do that to you. So perhaps if you were relying on the money that they had promised you, to use that money to organize the event. The money did not come till after the event, or perhaps the money did not come until the day of the event. What would you do in that regard? Assuming you have not planned for that kind of risk. It means that the event might end up getting canceled or postponed. So you need to really take this into consideration when you're planning as an event professional, right? And all these different kinds of financial risks, like I said, have the possibility to jeopardize the sound financial footing of your event organization. So it is very important that you pay close attention to financial risk especially because you need that financial backing to be able to successfully organize the event. Mercedes, please come in. Um, please, so with the, I realized that we were giving, um, identifying the categories that these um, risks fall under, but yes. for financial risk, uh, we didn't. Okay, so please. To find out where... So what category? <laughs> financial risk could be human cause. Mm, okay. I believe it's okay, human cause. Because, okay. for instance, when we talk about um, things like default risk, it's a human thing. The human being either yeah. decides to pay or not to pay. Or not to pay, sure. Because the market risk too is an interaction of various factors, including sometimes human intervention. Because when we talk about governmental factors, political factors, and regulatory factors, all these laws and, 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 and stuff are set by human means, right? Okay. right? Currency exchange rates too as a result of human activity, economic activity. And the sponsors to they are humans. The MD may, may have approved for the check to be paid, but the accountant is sitting on the check. True or false? Very true. <laughs> <laughs> that is a typical example of human related issues. <laughs> so thank you, Mercedes, for drawing our attention to that. Okay, thank you. All right, the next thing we can talk about is risk to your communication system. And what category will we place this one under? Technology. Okay, technology, yes. And there's another. Human cause. Good. Because voice communication can be endangered by perhaps the network breaking down, which may be a technological thing, 
through no fault of yours, the network operator may, may have their lines down in terms of that you can't make a call. But there are also human factors where I remember at a point in the University of Ghana to be able to stop students from receiving calls during lectures and disrupting lectures. They put scramblers in all the lecture halls. So when you enter a lecture hall, the scramblers scramble all the cell signals within that radio. So you will not be able to receive any phone call or send any, any message or anything. Does anyone know about these scramblers? Or oh, this is the first time you are hearing of them? Yes, the first time I'm hearing it. The married. first time I'm hearing it. Too. Okay, so they are scrambling. They scramble cell signal. So it, it, it will block your access at that particular point in time within a given radius, depending on how wide the reach of, of the scrambler is. And we had to do that at that point in time because the students were being very disrespectful. They'll come to class and instead of paying attention, they'll be browsing. So that is an example of how a human being can actually interfere with communication. Right, but walkie talkies, for instance, do not rely on, on those kinds of networks, they use a different kind of frequency to communicate. So, even when the, the cell networks are down with walkie talkies, you can still communicate with each other. So, you need to make sure that as a, an event professional, you have some walkie talkies or radio sets available that can communicate um, effectively in the absence of, of mobile phone networks. Right, so that's it for risk to communication system. Then reputation risks, which most of the time affects business continuity. Here, where can we place reputation risks? Reputation risks, what category? Adam and the human cause. Exactly. Because adverse media coverage, the media are, are, are human beings, they are journalists. So if they put a story out there about you, it can either be positive and build your business and reputation as an event professional or negative and destroy your reputation as an event professional. Allegations of safety deficiencies as well could pose a significant threat to your reputation as an event professional in your event organizing business. So if people come to your event and they go back and say, I had food poisoning, um, I, was, I was robbed, my car was broken into, these are all allegations of safety deficiencies that to a large extent can affect your reputation as an event professional. So you have to make sure that you put in place the necessary measures to protect your reputation. And this reputation protection begins with adequate risk management measures. So as an event professional, you can't afford to take chances because one event, however insignificant in your eyes, could be the source of your demise as an event professional. So you can't afford to take any chances. Risk management is the best bet to protect your reputation as an event professional. Then we can also talk about legal risk or perhaps litigation, right? Event professionals, like I said, in our part of the world are rarely um, taken on legally by events, clients, or attendees. However, it's a significant threat because you never know the day when someone may come to your event and get robbed, or someone may come to your event that you organize and get food poisoning and decide to pursue the matter to the full extent of the law, right? And in the event that this level of, of, of legal liability results in, in proof that you as the event professional have exhibited some form of negligence, or some form of lack of responsibility in identifying and pre preventing hazards, it could lead to long bouts of litigation in court and permanent damage to your business and your reputation as an event professional. So legal risk is a threat that every event professional faces from both attendees, volunteers. In fact, if you face some form of legal risk from, from almost every one of the stakeholders that we have identified, to your event. Because a vendor can sue you saying that you charge them a certain amount of money and when they came, they didn't get their money's worth. An attendee can sue you and say they came to your event and because of the way the event was set up, they were injured. A client can sue you and say you did not deliver what you promised at the beginning of signing the contract to have you organize the event. So these are all ways by which the event professional faces some kind of legal risk. Right? And in this case, what category will we place legal risk under based on the explanation that we have given? 
legal risk. Where will we place legal risk, ladies? Human cost. Thank you. Now, moving on to religious, moral, and ethical questions. I think it also falls back to the human uh, related, uh, human category of risks, where you have to consider the religious, moral, and ethical issues that may come with organizing an event. For instance, if the event you are organizing is being organized, say, for the Muslim community, they have a lot of rules and regulations that apply to them in terms of their religion. Certain things they cannot eat, certain, um, certain uh, things that they cannot be in the presence of, right? So you have to make sure that all these things are factored into their event. Likewise, if you're organizing an event for Jews or for Christians or for traditionalists, these days most Christians would not have alcohol at their events. Right? So as an event professional, you need to be able to make sure that you put in place measures to mitigate the risk of offending someone of a particular religious dispensation. So for instance, you can't serve um, meat at an event and only serve pork, knowing that Muslims will not consume pork. You have to be able to make sure that at your event, you have options for all these different religious um, denominations. The kosher people must get their food. The halal people must get their food, among others, right? And as an event professional, too, it's very important to observe religious holidays where necessary. So you notice that in Ghana here, for instance, people are very keen on observing the holidays of the Edo Ada, Edo Fetal, Christmas, Easter, Lent. People observe these things religiously. So as an event professional, you have to be able to make sure you plan your events with due reverence to these various religious holidays and what they be to the various people who belong to these religions. We can also talk about terrorism. And terrorism in Ghana here, though it is not a direct and immediate threat, it's a possibility. And when terrorism takes place, Guaranteeing the full security of attendees and participants is almost virtually impossible. However, you can put in place some precautions to be able to mitigate its effects. And it starts from having adequate security around and informing the security services of the events that is going to take place so that they can be able to adequately advise and keep an eye out during the time that the event is taking place. And then finally, we can talk about psychology, which is the risky fear. Right? The fear of risk in itself creates a whole new set of risks for you. Because from experience, when people panic, they are unable to take very good decisions. And these days, there's so much information out there that can easily create panic among individuals and among um, organizations, such that as an event professional, you may organize an event and the sheer fear that is in people's hearts and minds as a result of they have something they read off the internet or something that has been passed on through word of mouth will stop them from, from patronizing your event, which could influence the, the, the possibility of achieving the objectives you set out to achieve when you were planning the event. So it's very important to make sure that you, you, you organize your event in a manner that gives attendees the confidence to know that they do not run significant risk in attending your event. You need to put in place adequate measures, often through your communication, to let them know that they do not run significant risk of attending your event, so that they can be able to put aside all their fears and participate. And you as the event professional yourself, you should also be able to manage your fear and adequately mitigate risks and plan for them by putting in place risk management measures. And that is the only way that as an event professional, you can avoid the, the risky fear. So before we move on, where can we place psychology in terms of the, the risk categories? Where can we place psychology? Madam, human and technological, Think psychology will come under technological? Are you sure? Think about it again. Psychology. I 
I believe psychology is mainly human. Joan, do you agree? Yeah, because I was looking at the internet something, so I thought it will oh, come up. Internet is just a medium for information provision. But psychology is referring to what people do with that information. Okay. Uh -huh. So the information could come from the internet, it could come from the TV, it could come from the radio. Right? But what does that information do to your mind? And how does it influence your perceptions of fear and risk? Okay. okay. I was thinking it's the two. Okay, thank you, madam. You're welcome, John. So that is it for the various risk areas we can consider under the three categories that we discussed. So let's move on to talk about the event risk management process. Before we start, is there anything that someone needs clarification on or anything that you need an explanation on? Are we are good? Are we good? Yes, please, I'm fine. Okay. So let's move on to the event risk management process. So what is the event risk management process? It starts with, first of all, assessing the vulnerability of the event. Like we said in the definition of, of risk management, the risks need to be identified and they need to be analyzed. And they need to be evaluated in terms of how probable they are to occur. And when you are looking at the probability of occurrence, you need to rate them on a scale of rarely likely to occur or very likely to occur. So once you are able to determine that, you can be able to move on to now look at the severity of the consequences should they occur. And these consequences can be ranked on a scale of insignificant to catastrophic. So should an event occur, depending on how rare it is to occur and how likely it is to occur, its impact could either be insignificant or very catastrophic to your stakeholders, to the objective that you set out to achieve uh, for the event, as well as other outcomes that you, the event professional, expect to achieve through organizing the event. And to be able to assess the vulnerability of the event to potential risks, we use what we call the probability consequences analysis. So this is the probability consequences analysis framework. And it is designed in the form of a grid. But you can also put it on a graph with X and Y axis. On the Y axis, we have what we call the probability of occurrence. Remember, we said the probability of occurrence is rated from rare to likely, right? But here, they are using two main measures, being high probability and low probability. And then on the X axis, we have consequences which is rated on the, on, on the basis of low consequence and high consequence. Now, depending on the probability of the event occurring and the likely consequences that it would pose, be it high or low, we can be able to determine whether we can accept the uh, risk or we can manage it to not cause damage or we can completely avoid it. Now, when you are accepting, it means that there's nothing you can do about it. And you just allow it to happen and you deal with the consequences. When you can manage it, it means that there's something you can do about it. So you will manage it so that the consequences are not as severe as when you cannot do anything about it at all. And then where you can avoid it is where you, you, the, the risk is such that you can put in place adequate measures to stop it from happening completely. So based on the grid we are seeing, we can see that if the event has a high probability of occurring, but it has low consequences, we can either accept it or manage it. But if it has low probability of occurring and low consequences, we just accept it as it is. Because even if it happens, it will not influence the event to any significant degree. However, if the event has a high probability of occurring and the consequences are high, we need to do our best to put in place measures to avoid it. Or if we can't avoid it, put in place measures to manage it so that the consequences are not so dire. 
But finally, if the event has a low probability of occurring, but the consequences are high, we need to do our best to make sure that we manage it so that it does not have severe consequences for us. Please, does it make sense? Yes, doctor. Yes, please. Okay. Now, once we have been able to assess the vulnerability of the event in terms of the probability of the risk occurring um, and the consequences that the risk will pose, and bear in mind that you are doing this for each of the identified possible risks that could pose a threat or hazard to your event. So once you have done this, you need to move on and perform the risk evaluation. Now, in the risk evaluation, you prepare what we call a risk assessment matrix. And this will help you to be able to clarify your thinking on the concrete risks that your event may face. Because in the beginning, remember, you identify the events based on probability and, and consequence. So once you have been able to determine some events that have a probability of occurring and potential consequences, you need to be able to rank them. And that is where the risk assessment matrix comes in. And once you're able to rank them, it gives you a clarification on how to be able to deal with the various risks. Because remember we talked about the fact that certain risks are crisis level, some are disaster level, some are emergency level. And we can be able to tell whether they are crisis, disaster, or emergency based on the probability of occurring and the consequences that they pose. So once we, we have been able to, to determine the probability of occurring and the consequences, to be able to rank whether they are emergency, disaster, or crisis, we need to put them in the form of a risk assessment matrix. And this will give us a guideline of how to work to manage them or mitigate them, right? So we need to think of the interactions between the various hazard and risks, find out which ones we are going to accept based on the, 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 the matrix that we have, find out which ones we are going to avoid, find out which ones we are going to manage, depending on whether they are an emergency, disaster, or crisis. So let's look at a typical example of a risk assessment matrix. Please, can we see the matrix on the screen? Yes, sir. Good. Yes, please. Here they are presenting four main risks that they have identified can, event, can affect the events that they are organizing. And you realize they have five categories, right? What are the categories that they have? They have what? Consequence. Right? Yes, please. Probability. That's the probability of it occurring. The impact, should it occur. The trigger, which is very important, because here they are saying that there are certain things that can trigger that risk to become perhaps a crisis, a disaster, or an emergency. And then they have potential what? Responses. Should that risk uh, factor Okay, do we see that? Yes, please. Good. So let's look at risk number one that they identified, and they are calling it inclement weather. And they are saying that the consequences of this inclement weather could be that attendance may be low. And that is true. In Ghana, here, when it rains, people generally like to stay home, true or false? True. Good. Yes, it's true. true. And imagine you have invested a lot of money into this event. You will lose revenue. So they have as their second point, loss of revenue could be great. Because assuming you are expending people, you are expecting people to attend and spend money for you to be able to recoup your investment, they will not come. So yes, loss of revenue is a direct consequence of this um, inclement weather. And then injuries could occur due to the weather. Assuming some people are able to brave the weather and get there. And then perhaps the, the event is an outside event and there are strong winds and people were blown away or perhaps uh, canopies were blown and it hit people in the face and they got hurt. These are all kinds of things that could occur due to the weather, right? But they have run that the probability of it occurring is what? A medium probability. How do you think they were able to determine that the probability of it occurring is a medium probability? Maybe they were considering the season. Good. Let's see. 
in the rainy season or yeah good right so in, in, in ghana here we know what the rainy season is april may june july you can expect rain right so perhaps that's why perhaps they could have also conduct con, con, um, consulted the the weather forecast they have a weather forecast app that they were able to use to determine the likelihood that there, there will be some changes in the weather so good one joan so based on their assessment the impact of this will be what high so they place it as a, as a number one risk factor and i'm going to ask you a very interesting question now why do you think they put inclement weather before equipment failure in the risk assessment matrix madam yes because um the equipment failure can be um maybe 70 or 80 percent avoided but the uh, weather is natural be good now where does this one come from it comes from where the categories of risk right yes madam good where we talk about natural human and technological so in this case inclement weather is what category natural natural so we can't do anything about it mm -hmm. the equipment failure is more of what human human right so yeah. that is why inclement weather was placed above equipment failure so with inclement weather they are saying that the trigger could be on the day of the event a severe storm arrives just before or during the event they can't do anything about it it's an act of god right but the responses they could give is perhaps checkweather.com like i said use the the app to to check to see what they are saying about the weather and then if it's going to be severe put in place a, a contingency plan or they can mitigate it by providing rain rain coats umbrellas right and then they will say they said they will make an noun cements for any delays right and then the bands will perform under covered pavilions and have taps for exposed equipment so they are putting in place measures to even protect the equipment so that the rain will not damage them right and then in the case that they decide to accept you'll carry on with the event as long as the safety of the people is not in jeopardy so do you see they have they have ranked it based on what we saw in the matrix do you remember this matrix do you see it yes please you see the three possible responses here accept manage or avoid do you see yes please good yes please. so when we come to the matrix we see that they have ranked it in terms of the various responses accept manage or mitigate and avoid so in this case because it's an act of god how can they accept it they just carry on with the event as long as people people's lives are not in danger rain or shine right but they can find ways of mitigating it or, or managing it by giving people raincoats, giving them umbrellas, providing taps for the performance to be able to cover their equipment so that they don't get wet. But they can also avoid it by consulting the weather apps and those who know about the weather to make sure that they, they organize the event at a time where they do not have the threat of inclement weather. Next, they talk about what equipment failure. And here, the consequences of equipment failure, I think it's an event where they are having live band music. So they are saying the band scheduling can conflict with other schedules. So that means that it, it, it could potentially end up becoming a no-show. Or the event may be delayed due to scheduling conflict. Perhaps people were not ready. The caterers forgot that they were supposed to come at this time. The setup people were delayed in traffic. These are all ways by which and equipment failure can occur, right? And the concert goers can become upset due to the delays. Attendees often get angry when their time is wasted. And again, they believe the probability of this occurring is a medium probability, but the impact is high. And this could be triggered during the band setup equipment failure, or if the show is delayed, like we said, for whatever reason. So again, the three levels of response that they can have they can accept it and just move forward with the show and remove all unnecessary acts. So that means that if the band doesn't show up, they will accept it 
because in this case, they may have put in place a contingency plan to deal with it. So they'll go ahead without the ban, right? Or they can mitigate it by perhaps repairing the equipment, assuming the equipment were damaged, which was causing the delay, or have or shorten the act times and remove any in-between acts to cut down on time. So that those who did not show up, they can just take them out of, out of the, um, the schedule for the day and just go ahead with those who are present. Or they can avoid it totally by renting backup equipment in case some gets damaged, having a backup band to be able to make sure that the, the band, uh, regardless of which band doesn't show up, they still have people to perform and then have maintenance personnel perhaps or backup um, event vendors should one fail to show up, the other one will be ready and on hand. But the more contingency measures you put in place and the nature of these measures, the more investment you have to make in terms of resources. Because you may have to spend more money to get all these backups or backups. This may be a challenge for the event um, professional. The third risk they identified is a lack of sponsors. And here the consequences of a lack of sponsors could be that perhaps in their mind the event could be cancelled or the project will implode altogether, right? Or in the event that some sponsors do not show up, they will be unable to find new sponsors for the event or perhaps sponsors for subsequent events in the future. And because the sponsors are not there, they may not have enough resources to be able to fund the event. However, they see the probability of this occurring as a low probability and the impact of it being a medium impact, right? And this could be triggered, according to them, by several sponsors backing out and sending the project into a panic due to lack of funding. So what are their responses? Again, on the three levels, they can either accept it and go ahead without funding from sponsors. But in that case, a lot of other things that they wanted to do with regards to the events that may have required additional funding, they may not be able to do it. Or they can mitigate it by putting in place measures such that if sponsors back out, they'll have new ones to replace them immediately. Or they'll actually put in place measures to avoid the lack of sponsors happening totally by committing all the sponsors who they bring on board to a written signed contract so that it will be very difficult for them to back out. And then the fourth and final risk that they identified is crowd control. And in this case, the event we, that they are organizing, as we have seen, is a concert. And when it comes to concerts, crowds can sometimes get out of hand, which is one of the consequences that they have stated. And like we mentioned, whenever there's a lot of people at a place, fights may ensue. People may start fighting for no reason, out of nowhere, right? And some of these fights may lead to injuries. Sometimes for people who are not even directly involved in the fight. Right? And it may anger some of the people who attended the event because they did not pay to come and watch people fight. They came for a particular experience. However, the event professionals have characterized this event as, as having a low probability of occurring. However, the impact could be high. Right? And they have identified a strong trigger, which is one of the risk areas that we talked about, being alcohol and sometimes even drugs. Because some of these people engage in, in most of these fights out, out of the influence of these drugs and alcohol that they consume, sometimes prior to coming to the event or during the event. And it can lead them to become rowdy, which is the number one trigger that they have identified could, could cause the fight. So what are the responses that they can have? They, they once again refer back to the three response levels. They either accept it by having emergency services on hand, which are the EMTs, to deal with any injuries that may, may come about, right? And also have police and other security to deal with rowdy concert goals. Remember we talked about the fact that security is necessary to be able to, to, to do um, efficient crowd management, because at some point in time, they may have to escort some unruly or unwelcome people out of the premises of the event. The second level of response could be to mitigate it by having the police and the event security deal with the rowdy concert goers accordingly and escorting them off the premises, like I just said. Or you can avoid it by having the local police present in accordance to law and event security consistently patrolling. Sometimes the presence of security puts fear into people. 
and it makes them control themselves and behave better than they would have if security was not present. And that is why during the presentation of your site, Liam, I kept emphasizing that security and emergency services are non-negotiable. They have to be present at all times. Please, does it make sense? Yes, please. Good. Yes, please. Now, some organizations come out with their own risk assessment templates, especially when you're an event professional that you have a company and these are things that you engage in on a daily basis. So I want to show you three of such templates from um, different organizations so that you can appreciate what they would look like in case you are developing your own. So let's look at this. Please, can you see the screen? Yes, yes please. please. All right. So this one is an event uh, risk assessment template belonging to the Golden Plains Shire. It's a, it's a town and they have events regularly. So they saw the need to come up with this risk assessment template to help them to be able to assess the level of risk of each event and then adequately plan for it. So it starts with um, different explanations of, of the need for, for managing risks and then what risk assessment is, right? And then they also explain how to do risk assessment. And they say it involves finding the risk, right? So you list all the possible hazards and situations which we have discussed assessing it and then ways of fixing it and remember we talked about the fact that there are three ways of handling the risk when you identify it do you remember do you remember the three ways we talked about hello i just went through them over and over again depending on the probability of its occurrence and its consequences. So there are three causes of yes. action. Good. Namely. Strong, human, and then the technological. No, those are categories. I said that depending on, on the probability of the risk of occurring and the consequences of the risk, there are three causes of action that the event professional can take. So you can avoid. Avoid. Uh -huh. Mitigate or manage and then accept. Awesome. Thank you very much. So that in essence is what they have categorized here. Finding it, assessing it, and fixing it. And fixing it involves the three ways that we have just uh, talked about. So in addition to this, they have created their risk ranking matrix, right? And they have done it on the basis of the, of the range that we, we, we mentioned earlier before we talked about the probability consequence analysis. And they have looked at the likelihood of it occurring to the consequences, right? Similar to what we talked about in terms of probability consequence, but they have more levels of the breakdown. We had two, high and low, but they have more between high and negligible and then catastrophic and negligible. So in terms of likelihood of, of occurring, which we described as probability of occurrence, in our description, in the previous discussion we had, we said probability of occurrence could be high or low. But for the purposes of their event that they organized in their town, they said the likelihood or the probability of occurrence could be high, significant, moderate, low, or negligible. And then in terms of consequences, we also talked about the fact that the consequences could be high and low in our previous discussion. However, for their purposes, they have ranked consequences in terms of catastrophic, major, moderate, low and negligible and for each permutation depending on whether um, the event falls on high significant moderate low or negligible on the likelihood scale as compared with where it falls on the consequence scale be it catastrophic major moderate low or negligible they give it a ranking so the color tells you how severe the risk is and what you need to be able to do to, to mitigate or avoid or accept it. Now they go down further to explain the metrics that they have created. And they explain each of the rankings they have given in terms of likelihood and consequence. So they say when, in terms of the likelihood of, of the event occurring, when it is a high likelihood, it means that the event is, of, is expected to occur in most circumstances. And there's a strong likelihood of a hazard reoccurring. 
When they talk of a significant likelihood, they mean that similar hazards have been reported on a regular basis in the past. And then they consider that it is likely that the hazard could occur. When it's a moderate likelihood, it means that incidents or hazards have occurred infrequently in the past, right? And then when it's a low likelihood, very few known incidents of that particular occurrence have taken place, or perhaps that's not occurred yet, but it has the likelihood of occurring sometime. And then negligible likelihood is where there's no known or recorded incident of that particular hazard occurring, and there's a remote chance that it will occur in an exceptional circumstance. Then they come down to the consequence um, definitions where they, they, they explain each of the levels of the consequence scale. So when they say the consequence of an event occurring is catastrophic, it means that the occurrence of that particular hazard or risk could lead to multiple or, of, or single deaths, costs of up to $5 million, and it could lead to international and national media coverage. So that is where they deem an event as catastrophic. Where the event is major, they deem it as having serious health impact on multiple or single persons or permanent disability, right? And the cost to, uh, to the event could be between 2.5 and $5 million, and it could lead to national media coverage. So yeah, there's no international media coverage. Then under moderate consequences, it's more than 10 days rehabilitation that will be required for the people who get injured as a result of the occurrence of that hazard. And the cost could be between $200,000 and $2.5 million. And it would only attract local media and community concern. Now, if it has a low consequence, it means that the injuries to the persons will result only in lost time and, and a few claims, right? But no permanent injuries or, or injuries that will require significant rehabilitation. And the cost could be between $50,000 and $200. And there'll be minor isolated concerns raised by stakeholders or customers when something like this occurs. And in the event that the event, uh, the occurrence has a negligible consequence, it means that the persons who are involved or persons who are affected may just require perhaps minimum first aid. And the cost could, could just be in the realm of $50,000 and below. And it will have a minimal impact on the reputation of the event organizers, right? So they, apart from this, also have their hierarchy of controls. They don't stop at the accept, mitigate, or, or manage and avoid a paradigm. They have developed their own levels of controls. And that includes elimination, substitution, engineering, right? Isolation, administration, as well as personal protective equipment to be able to mitigate the various levels of consequences, as well as the probability of hazards that could occur as a result of organizing these various events that they do in their town. So they want to give an example of a risk assessment and they show you how to be able to use it to, to develop um, your own for your event based on what you have, based on what they have explained up there. So I will upload this into Sakai and when you get time, you can go through it and, and familiarize yourself with it. Please, I hope that will be okay. Yes, please. Yes, please. Good. Good. Okay. So moving back to our slides. Now that we have been able to develop the risk assessment matrix and we've seen the kind of risks that we are in for, and we've been able to identify the possible consequences, triggers, and then the probable responses we can give to be able to control it. We need to implement the risk treatment and control measures. And this usually happens before, during, or after the event, right? And it's as a result of the event professional being able to fully understand as a result of developing the risk assessment matrix developing the probability of it occurring, its consequences, and outlining possible ways of controlling the effects, be it through acceptance, management or mitigation, and avoidance, they can be able to implement all these plans that they have come up with because they have gained an understanding of the risk and use it to manage the potential hazards that will come up during the period of planning the event and then during the time that the event is taking place and sometimes after the event. 
Now, these have in, in, in common the transfer of the risk sometimes to those who have the resources, including the skills, knowledge and experience, or deep pockets to handle it. So for instance, avoiding or presenting certain risks which are not worth it, right, will involve passing on the, the responsibility to the event professional. Do you agree? Do you agree that the responsibility of avoiding or preventing certain risks, which are not worth it, lies solely with the event professional? Yes, please. How? How so? So when the event professional is able to identify the risk from the beginning, he, he or she can put in place measures to avoid those risks. Good. Thank you, Gloria. So that means that as an event professional, if you have been able to see that there's an activity that you are going to undertake or something that is being done, that is a trigger for a possible risk or hazard, it's your duty to avoid it so that it will not happen in the first place. Next, special preparations can also be put in place before the event or during the event to make sure that certain hazards and risks do not take place. So for instance, assuming there is a risk or hazard of, of um, theft and fighting. Which stakeholder can we transfer this risk to, to manage on our behalf as event professionals? Assuming there is the threat or the hazard of theft and fighting. Security. Thank you. So security. Or in extreme instances, the police. Okay. Assuming there is the risk, another one. Assuming there is the risk of, of allergic reactions, injuries, and certain medical conditions, who can the event professional transfer the risk to? The caterer. The, the, the medical team at the, the the medical team on site because they are the people who have the skills to be able to tend to injured people be able to treat people with allergic reactions be able to treat people with medical conditions you the event professional do not have the skills or the knowledge to even attempt that right so those are a few examples of of who to transfer specific risks to given their skill sets the knowledge that they have and the experience that they have to be able to handle it and by doing that, we are able to reduce the vulnerability of the event to all these different hazards. But in extreme cases where the hazards are such that you cannot really do much to mitigate them or avoid them, and there's so many of them that could lead to dire catastrophic consequences, canceling the event may just be the way to go. Or if you can avoid canceling it, and rather go for the lesser evil of changing specific aspects of the events that pose significant threats. Like for instance, the venue. If the venue that you are using now exposes people to the hazard of the roof collapsing, then perhaps you should move it to a venue that does not have a roof, that is an open space. If it's a children's party that you are trying to have around the pool that exposes children to the hazard of drowning, Perhaps you should move it to a children's park where it's all grass and they can run around and play without the possibility of anyone getting drowned. So these are several ways by which as an event professional, you can implement risk treatment and control measures to ensure that the objectives of your event are successful. So like I said, based on the example that we just saw, there's a hierarchy of controls that you can go through. You can either go with the controls that are provided per the probability consequence matrix that shows as the three types of control measures you can put in place, be it accept, mitigate, or, or manage and avoid to be able to control the effects of certain hazards on your event. Or like these people have done, come up with their own hierarchy of controls should certain hazards occur during their event. And these include elimination, where they remove or stop the hazard if possible, or remove the cause or source of the hazard by eliminating, perhaps if it's a machine that will cause it, eliminating the machine, which will involve altering certain aspects of the event that we just talked about, 
right? And if it's not practical, perhaps canceling the whole event altogether until you can find a safer way to hold the event without causing hurt or damage. They also have as part of their control substitution. Can certain things that are posing hazards be substituted? For instance, like I mentioned earlier in the example, if you are having the children's party around the swimming pool and it poses a significant hazard, is it possible to move it to, the, to a venue that has not have a swimming pool? Or if there must be a pool for children to play, can you substitute it with an inflatable pool that is not so deep and not so dangerous such that children who fall into it or jump into it will drown? Please, does it make sense? Yes, yes. yes. Or you can solve it by engineering or changing the equipment. Perhaps, like they are saying, you can introduce enclosures around the pool so that you can lock it and then the children will be able to have the party around the pool, but there's no way of them getting close to the water, let alone to fall into it. Or you can perhaps do isolation, where you are doing it in the same venue, they have the same Kempinski Hotel, but isolate them to the part that is not close to the pool area. Or changes could also be done in terms of um, administrative procedures. You can design and communicate with of verbal procedures that present the hazard from occurring. For instance, you can ask parents to keep an eye on their children, stop them from entering the water, make sure that their children are with them at all times. Right? Or you can introduce personal protective equipment by making sure that you give every child a life vest the moment they enter the premises. So that in case by, by any weird means they fall into the water, the life vest will anchor them and they will not sink or drown. Please, does it make sense? Yes, please. Good. So these are various hierarchy of controls that as an event um, professional you can introduce. But the most important thing that as an event professional you need to do is to record event activity. Because without having a, an, an adequate log of past events, possible risks that have occurred, it will be very difficult for you to be able to rank events and the possible hazards that these events present in terms of their probability of occurring and their consequences. Because if you do not have a history or record of some of these events that you have organized and the hazards that happen, it will be very difficult for you to conceptualize or fathom the probability that some of these hazards can occur and the possible consequences that they can pose. Sometimes you may not have a full picture from your previous events. But as a, uh, as a direct consequence of recording event activity, other event professionals will definitely have a log of some of these risks, like the way we have been able to get examples to use in class today. And it will guide you to be able to determine the probability of different risks and hazards occurring as they are associated with specific events and the consequences that they pose to the success of your event or otherwise. So when you are recording your event activity, you need to be able to put in place measures to record every single thing that was happening before, during, and after the event. You need to be able to determine whether the risks that you identified before the event occurred. If none of them occurred, you record it. If some occurred, you record it. And then you record the, the means by which you were able to go about, say, avoiding them, managing them, or, or accepting them. At the same time, too, if there were certain risks that you did not identify in the beginning, and therefore they were not able to prepare for, but for some reason happened during the event, you need to record that as well for future reference, so that in subsequent events you can be able to plan for these risks which occurred that you did not anticipate. And once you record them, it is not just enough to record them and then after event, the event, throw them somewhere. No. You record them. And remember, we talked about the post-event report. They should be recorded and put in a usable and, and, and clear format as part of your post-event report so that you can review them with your team afterwards and see what you did right, what you did wrong, and what you can do better in the future. Because a lot of what we do and what you will do in the future as event professionals will be largely based on your experience. So if you are not able to keep these logs, it will be very difficult for you to build upon your experience. Because as, as one of my, my colleagues will say, with old age comes memory loss. 
which I do not agree with, but it's true in a lot of cases. Please, do you agree with, 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 with my, my colleague who says with old age comes memory loss? Please, do you agree with that, Tim? Um, yes. Please. Please. Memory loss or forget well? <laughs> so for the best of people, as they, they grow older and as time passes, they forget certain things. So there's no way you can keep an accurate log of all the possible risks and hazards that occurred in all the events that you organized in your head. Sometimes some events, you, when you're organizing them, it's so traumatic that when you finish, you don't even want to remember anything about the event again. So you subconsciously block everything out. So this is the best opportunity for you to be able to keep an accurate log, such that even if you are not the one running the business in future, perhaps you handed it over to your child, or you've employed someone to take over the business and run it on your behalf, they will have an adequate log and record of all the previous events you've organized, possible risks and hazards that came up, and they can use that as a stepping stone to be able to plan and adequately prepare in terms of risk management for future events that you are going to be organizing. And with that, we've come to the end of our session for today. Does anyone have any question they want to ask, anything they need clarification on? before we sign off.